Our scripture lesson today is from the New Testament book of Ephesians, the second chapter. Hear now these words. At one time you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to act like most of the people of the world do. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. However, God is rich in mercy. God brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. God did this because of the great love God has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of God's grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Do we have among us today any fans of the old Andy Griffith show? Just a few. My husband, Richard, likes to lead a Bible study using episodes of that old Andy Griffith show as illustrations. So if any of you are interested in that kind of Bible study, let Richard know. He'll be glad to host it for us. But he likes to quote one of those old episodes in particular. He quotes it to me whenever he sees me struggling to write a sermon. It comes from an episode that was aired in 1963 entitled, A Sermon for Today. And in that particular episode, there is a visiting pastor from New York who fills the pulpit at All Souls Methodist Church right there in Mayberry. The guest minister, Harrison Everett Breen, tells the town to relax and enjoy the simple pleasures of life. Well, Deputy Barney Five takes that message to heart a little bit too much and he falls asleep during the sermon. When the service is over, Aunt B walks out and she says, Oh, Dr. Breen, your sermon today was such a wonderful lesson for all of us. And Andy's right behind her, Sheriff Andy Taylor, and he says, Yes, sir, you really hit the nail right on the head. And so Barney's right behind him, and he says... Yes, sir. I tell you what, that's one subject you can't talk too much about, sin. Oops. Oops. Was he talking about sin? Maybe. Sin's a word that too many of us, I believe, avoid talking about and even thinking about. Now, I think you all know me well enough by now to know that I'm a person who preaches 99% of the time about a God of grace and love. I don't like talking about sin and judgment any more than the next person. But from time to time, we need to face the facts 
as the Holy Scriptures tell us, that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, we were all created in the image of God as our wonderful children's lesson reminded us. We're created in God's image, and we are to live lives marked by those fruits of the Spirit that Paul wrote about to the church in Galatia. Those fruits of the Spirit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, self-control. Sin, my friends, is anything that mars the image of God within our lives and gets in the way of God's dream for this world. And when we react to any situation with something less than our best selves, rather than responding to it in appropriate ways with the resources that God has given to us, we mar that image of God within us. When we buy into the warped models of success and the good life in this world, like that old adage that says, the one with the most toys wins, then we mar the image of God. When we hate instead of love, we mar the image of God. When we resort too quickly to force, instead of pursuing gentler courses of action, we mar the image of God. We mar the image of God and we get in the way of God's purposes for this world when we don't speak up and we don't stand up when we see injustices in this world, when we see others going hungry, when we see others being punished, when we see prejudice taking place in this world. In those times, we mar the image of God. And the biblical faith proclaims that this happens to every one of us. I think you'd all agree. We all fall short at times of our best selves. Who among us has not experienced making a mess out of something and longing for a do-over, a chance to do it again, a new beginning, a clean slate? Most of us have. Most of us long for the kind of place described in a poem by Louise Fletcher Tarkington. The poem is titled, The Land of Beginning Again, and it says, I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. The land of beginning again. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a land of beginning Again, well, there is, and you are here. This, my friends, is the land of beginning again, Christ Holy Church, especially when we celebrate the meal that we're about to celebrate today, a meal of Holy Communion, a meal that was born of love and grace. It is the land of beginning again. Listen again to the words that I read at the start from that wonderful text in Ephesians, verses 3 through 5 said, All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted to do, so that you were children headed for punishment, just like anyone else. However, God, in rich mercy, brought us to life with Christ. While we were dead as a result of the things that we did wrong, God did this because of God's great love for us. You are saved by God's grace. God's grace grants to each one of us, my friends, a second chance, a third chance, as many chances as we need to start over again every time we mess up and we don't live up to being our best selves. That's the good news of the Christian faith. That's the good news that Jesus came to deliver. We are forgiven. We are given a fresh start, a new chance with the help of Christ in our lives. There's a story that I read one time about a church service in which a young woman felt the tug of the Holy Spirit in her heart 
And she responded to God's call of grace and accepted Jesus into her life and this new beginning, this fresh start. This young woman, you see, had had a very rough past. She was involved in alcohol and drugs and prostitution in her life. But the change became very evident in her life as she got more and more involved in this land of new beginnings called the church. She became a faithful member of the church, and she eventually was involved in the ministry of teaching the young children in the church. It was not very long until this thoroughly converted young woman caught the eye of the pastor's young son. Their relationship grew. It grew into a deep love, and they began to make wedding plans. But that's where the problem began. You see, about half of the church did not think that a woman with such a past as hers was suitable for a pastor's son's wife. And so the church began to argue and fight over the matter. And they decided to have a meeting to hash it out. As the people made their arguments, the tensions increased and the meeting got completely out of hand. The young woman became very upset and tearful. People kept bringing up her past, and it hurt. As she began to cry, the pastor's son stood up. He could not bear to see his soon-to-be wife treated that way spoken of that way, reminded of all that she had done in her past. And this is what he said. He said, my fiancé's past is not what is really on trial here today. What you are really questioning, you are questioning Christ's ability to forgive and give us a new beginning. So I ask all of you good people, can Christ forgive everything that we've done and truly wash the slate clean and give us a new beginning? That's the question before the congregation. It's a powerful question, isn't it? Most of us are held back in life because of regrets of things we've done or said or left undone in our past. But if we truly believe that all in our past can be forgiven and that we're given a fresh start, a new beginning, a clean slate to move forward, that we can leave behind all of that baggage and move forward in freedom and grace, then let us do that. Do we truly believe that God forgives all and gives us a new beginning? Or is that just something we think about but can't truly appropriate in our own hearts and lives? Is it something that we think applies to other people but not to us? That our past is so horrible that we can't get over it? Or do we truly believe that we can have a new beginning in life? United Methodist pastor and writer James Moore has written some wonderful books and tells great stories. And one of those stories that he tells is about a pastor friend of his named Tom who served as pastor of a very large congregation in New York City. He said that his friend Tom likes to tell the story about a special communion service in his church. He said that Tom, although he served a very large congregation and was busy all of the time, he made time every single week to go to a soup cellar in town and have lunch with the homeless people who ate there every day, much like the soup cellar here at Washington Street. After the homeless people had been fed and he fellowshiped with them some during the meal, he would invite them into a little chapel at that homeless shelter to share in the meal of Holy Communion with him. 
One day, Tom says he had an unforgettable experience during that communion service. He says he was moving up and down the altar where the people were kneeling and serving them the bread and the cup. And he came to a man who was kneeling there who looked like he had been on the streets for quite a while, dirty and disheveled, downtrodden. The man looked up as, at Tom as he came by with that tray with the bread and the cup, and the man whispered to Tom, Skip me. Tom said, What? The man said, Skip me. Tom said, Why? The man said, I'm not worthy. Tom said, Neither am I. I tell you what, I'm going to serve the rest of the people who are kneeling here, and then I'm going to come back to you, and I'm going to serve you the bread and the cup because they are given for you. And then I'm going to ask you to serve me. The man looked at Tom and said, What? Is that legal? And the pastor said, yeah, it's legal. So the pastor served the other people, and then he came back, and he knelt down by Tom, and he offered him the bread, and he offered him the cup. And he said, take and eat. Remember that you are loved and forgiven and given a fresh start. The man nervously took the bread and the cup, and he ate and he drank. And then Tom gave to him those silver trays, and he said, now you serve me. The man took his weathered, dirty hands and laid them on those silver plates, shaking. And then he looked over one shoulder and over the other as if he was thinking that the FBI or the CIA or maybe the Pope or somebody was going to come in and tell him he was doing something wrong. And he looked at Tom and he said, are you sure this is legal? Tom said, yeah, it is. Serve me. So the man said, bread, juice, Jesus, for you, hang in there. <laughs> and Tom took the bread and the cup, and he said, he never thought about those words, hang in there, as being tied to communion liturgy before. But it was a very holy moment for him as he realized that this wonderful meal is a reminder to hang in there, keep going, striving for all those beautiful gifts of the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life and manifest in the world around you. Live that kind of life. Tom says after the meal was over, that homeless man stood up and he walked a little bit straighter. And he went outside of the sanctuary with a spring in his step. And he reported to everyone everywhere what he had just done. You won't believe what I did today. And that story became so widespread that this man became known on the streets as the Rev, which of course means the Reverend that holy transformation in his life. What a great story of love and grace, acceptance, forgiveness, reconciliation, bridge building. That's what Holy Communion is. It's a story that reminds us that our past doesn't have to define us. Our past mistakes and sins can be forgiven, and we can begin again. That is what Jesus practiced throughout his ministry here on earth. That is what the cross reminds us of. That is what this meal reminds us of. This meal was born of love and grace, and we are invited to come and receive it in this land of beginning again.